Well, welcome everyone. It is so good to have you with us this morning. We just have a couple of announcements before we get started. First up is our Lent in a Bag. If you would like to sign up to receive Lent in a Bag, you can head to our website. Uh, we're going to be celebrating the season of Lent together. And inside those bags, there's going to be a devotional for you or for your family, as well as lots of items and activities uh, for your kids as well to interact with the services during the season of Lent. Um, next is our membership class. Uh, we have one coming up on February 7th. So if you would like to become a member at Burnett Fellowship Church, you can head to our website to sign up for that as well. We are so glad that we get to be together this morning. Uh, it's a time where we get to uh, hear from the word. We get to sing songs together. And so do something a little different this morning. Maybe if you're still in bed, rise. Maybe if you are sitting around, stand up. Do as you feel called. It's time to worship.
Have you noticed how people love to pick fights? The Canadian Army Journal reported that since the year 3600 BC, so that's 5,620 years of time, the world has only known 292 years of peace. There's been no fighting. 292 out of 5,620 years. But during that same period of time, there have been over 1,500 wars. More than 3.7 billion people have been killed in fights. And the reality is we, we just fight over dumb things. Uh, let's start with the Canadian issue. Ever hear of the Pig War of 1859? It was between U.S. and Canada, or uh, the British soldiers who were there for Canada, and they were fighting over the San Juan Islands. Uh, perhaps fighting is the wrong word. They were trying to make it their territory. And there was a, a British fort that was built on the northwest end of one of the islands, and there was an American fort on the south end and both the American and British loyalists settled on the disputed land, and they lived there in peace. Well, relative peace. And in fact, every week, there was a, a weekly dance on Friday night. And that weekly dance on Friday night would be held, uh, say, this week at the British fort and the next week at the American fort and it divided back and, and all was calm, all was bright, well, calm until an uh, Irishman's pig decided that the vegetable garden on the American side looked better than his own. And so the pig went into the American's vegetable garden. So, the American shot the pig. After all, you know, it's in their constitution. To, we have the right to bear arms. So, the British people said, well, you can't do that, and they went to arrest the American named Cutler. And he, in turn, used his one phone call to bring in the U.S. military. And the U.S. military arrived with 66 soldiers to get their man back. And then the British responded with two warships. All of this over a dead pig. And in the end, the British had five warships, 2,140 men stationed on the island, and the Americans had 461 men and 14 cannons. I mean, it wasn't a bloody war. In fact, there were absolutely no reports of casualties but it was a huge embarrassment for everybody. I mean, it took 12 years until they got back to the weekly dance ritual. Crazy. Or, or how about the War of Jenkins' Ear? It happened earlier than that, 1739. The Spanish always resented the British Empire and the fact that in their day, the British was the world's greatest nation. So... One day in 1731, Captain Robert Jenkins had his mer uh, merchant ship boarded by the Spanish Coast Guard on his return home from picking up stuff for Britain in the West Indies. And they bound Captain Jenkins to the mast, and why, I don't know, but they sliced off his ear. On his return home, Jenkins took his complaint directly to the king, and a few years later to parliament, and showing his ear, which he had carefully kept in a pickle jar. Nobody really seemed to care about Jenkins' ear and the fact that he lost it until a number of years later in 1739, the British were looking for a just cause, a just reason to start a war against Spain. Oh, say, wasn't there a pickled ear somewhere that needed to be avenged? <laughs> so a rather half-hearted engagement 
slowly blundered on until for nearly a decade. At the end of this war, the Spanish had lost 186 ships, 4,500 men, another 5,000 wounded. And the British, who say they won, they lost 407 ships and 20,000 men died. <laughs> and all over in a year. There was conflict. Inevitably, there was going to be conflict in the book of Nehemiah as we come here. And, and what we see as we look at Nehemiah, the person, the, the leader, is that he accomplished what he accomplished because in the midst of conflict, he stayed focused on the goal. Leaders focused on the goal determine what deserves attention. Nehemiah had moved to Jerusalem. He knew the conflict was inevitable. And that's why he was so careful to get the letters that he needed, letters of permission from the king. And with his goal being to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, that goal would determine whether or not he would respond and how he would respond to the opposition. Conflict comes in our lives. And so this morning, we want to think about how we handle conflict. When Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. If, as we've been going through the book of Nehemiah, you are reading through it too, let me just uh, help you understand how the book unfolds. Not all of the book is uh, strictly chronological. Uh, chapter 1, for example, is the birth of this vision when Nehemiah hears from his brother for about the need for the rebuilding of the wall. Chapter 2 enlists the support uh, of the king of Persia. And chapter 3 tells of the rebuilding of the wall. But we noticed last week when we looked at chapter 3 that even chapter 3 is not chronological. Every section of the wall was being built simultaneously. Chapters 4 through 7 recount different kinds of opposition that Nehemiah faced during the 52 days of the rebuilding of the wall. And these Conflicts that surfaced were not uh, necessarily chronological, but they, have you ever noticed that, that problems can often enter your life in bunches, in groups, in bouquets of trouble? <laughs> and so all of the kinds of problems that he faced over the course of the rebuilding of the wall are mentioned in chapters 4 through 7. And what we discover in Nehemiah is that a leader focused on the goal prioritizes what deserves his attention, what conflicts have to be responded to, how they're going to respond to different kinds of conflicts. The very first kind of conflict is uh, uh, the facing of criticism. Conflict often begins with criticism, doesn't it? Uh, people become disillusioned or uh, upset about something, and they begin to talk, and they begin to uh, belittle the efforts that are being done. Someone doesn't like your approach to things, or they're fearful of what the result might be. I, I, th I think 
and, and then they become critical of others. I, I think we've seen some of that in our coronavirus period of time right now. Uh, a, a time when uh, there are uh, some people who are following religiously to the uh, suggestions that, uh, the, and mandates that are being made as to how we live, and other people who are uh, thinking that it's, it's not everything that it's cranked up to be. And how do we respond to people who differ from us? Can we be respectful, or do we begin to criticize the way the others are doing it? The reality is nothing good has ever been born without a critical, without critics weighing in and pronouncing doom and gloom along the way. Notice what it says as we begin chapter 4. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and greatly incensed. So what did he do? He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, oh, what are those Hebrews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from the heap of rubble? Burned as they are? What he's doing is he's beginning to mock. It's a form of criticism where he, he just belittles the process, belittles what they're doing, minimizes their efforts. The problem with criticism, though, is it's infectious, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it spreads like a virus. And the problem is there's no real vaccination. I'm not thinking at all about an issue, maybe in my mind, but somebody begins a conversation pointing out, look at the problem with this, look at the problem with that. And I go, oh, yeah, I never thought of that. And all of a sudden, I'm agreeing without listening to the other side without really thinking about it myself. So Sambalat may have started, but notice in verse 3 it says, Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, well, what are they building if even a fox climbed up on it? It would break down their walls of stone. You see, criticism just grows. It gains momentum. And... And so what's the answer? How does one respond to criticism? Well, Nehemiah did. Again, this is Nehemiah. This is what he does. Nehemiah just prayed. And Nehemiah didn't, didn't take it on. He didn't let it stop him. He, he just prayed. He doesn't even respond to Sambalad. He doesn't talk to Tobiah. He just, he just takes it to God. And in verse 4, he says, hear us, our God, for we are despised. So turn their insults, their criticism back on their own head. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Now, well, this is no mousy prayer. I mean, everything Nehemiah might have said to Sambalat, you know, let them die. He, he doesn't say it to Sambalat. He, he says it to God. He said, I'm not going to fight words with words. I, I'm not going to respond in kind. But I am going to go to God and say, hey, God, you, you, you get these guys. I'm thinking mercy was way down on Nehemiah's gift list, you think? Maybe. But he was ticked off. He was tired. He was in no mood for silly games. And he was in no mood for petty jealousies. But he doesn't attack his critics. He takes it to God. How much better would we be when criticism surfaces that we don't respond as we would like, but respond by bringing it to God? And then he just turned his hand back to the work that was necessary. He, he took it in prayer to God, and then he persevered. He persevered. So it says, I love this verse, verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their hearts. He says, we're just going to keep going. 
We're not going to let the, the critics distract us from what needs to be done. To persevere means that we ignore criticism. It means that we keep moving on. If we're convinced that this vision is of God, then we need to keep at the task because leaders remain focused on the goal, on the objective, ignoring the distractions around them. Don't let criticism absorb your time and energy. Give it to God and find that he gives you strength to be able to persevere even in the face of those who would criticize.
Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. We have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. But we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and accused the nobles and the officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I kept together a large meeting to deal with them. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. When word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set doors in the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm Nehemiah. So I sent the messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent the same message, and each time they received the same answer. Then the fifth time, Sambalat sent his aide to Nehemiah with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written the accusation, you have made yourself king in Judah. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. They were all trying to frighten us. Well, as we've noticed, conflict often begins with criticism, but, but it gets ramped up. I mean, as particularly as barbs are shared back and forth, it inevitably escalates. But, but here's another problem, is that as it escalates, the source of trouble cannot be, uh, can be troubling. I, I mean, it's not always the enemy that we know who creates the problem. And chapter four was the enemy outside Sambalat and Tobiah. And we'll hear from them again. They don't go away. But chapter five are a whole set of new problems, but these problems are not from without, they're from within. It, it's tough when we face conflict. Uh, the criticism that arose, uh, it, it, it represented an internal, uh, an external conflict, but, but now it was moving inside. It would, it would be nice if we only ever had to fight the enemy. But all too often, we turn our guns on each other. Friendly fire in the midst of conflict. So chapter 5 is this external conflict. And in chapter 5, verse 1, it says this. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters were numerous, and in order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. You see, there was a famine that had infested the land. Others were saying, in verse 3, we are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. In verse 4, still others were saying, uh, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards, and although we're of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and although our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. They were selling their kids into slavery to get enough money to pay taxes. He said, some of our daughters have already been enslaved, and we're powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Nothing does more harm in the family of God than division, criticism, uh, one person against another who are brother or sister in Christ. Criticism from without, Nehemiah could just ignore. But internal strife requires immediate action, and especially when it was a justice issue. Injustice among God's people should not exist, and it impedes spiritual progress of all. Notice what happened. In verse 6, he said, When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very 
angry. And I pondered them in my mind. And then I accused the nobles and the officials. And I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them. And I said, as far as possible, we have brought back, bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. And they remain quiet because they can find nothing to say. You see, there's, there's a time for straight talk. Uh, too often, we fail to confront when, when things dishonor God, when, when things are going wrong, when injustice exists, and we, we try and hide and not deal with it. But if not dealt with, that always leads to a greater issue down the line. If you read the rest of chapter 5, you found that uh, Nehemiah not only confronted uh, the Jewish leaders who uh, were using their place of influence to to fleece their pockets and and keep a distance between the rich and the poor, but he led by example because he was a leader. And the stipend that came uh, for being the governor, all of his pay, and all that he had, he, he just spread it around. He, he spread it around to feed as many people as possible. And he rebuked the nobles. He came to the assistance of those who were experiencing injustice. And he dealt with the issue. See, goal-oriented leaders may choose to ignore criticism because it's just there. But they never ignore people, especially when it comes to matters of justice and injustice. And then we see as we come to the next chapter that they were uh, discerning the divisions, diversions, the the different things were being thrown at them, Sambalat, Tobiah come back, and they throw different things at them to try and dissuade them from keeping going. I mean, if you thought we were finished with Sambalat and Tobiah, you're wrong. Uh, the criticism doesn't work. That didn't stop anything. So now they, they tried a different approach. They, they tried all kinds of different diversions, three different kinds of diversion. The first was uh, distraction. Maybe we can distract them from the wall. So it says in verse 6, or chapter 6, rather, in verse 2, Sambalat, the Geshem, sent this message Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the path, plain to Orno. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and I cannot go. Why would the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? And four times they sent me the same message and each time I gave them the same answer. You see, the plan was simple. Let's isolate Nehemiah, and and that pulls him away, pulls the leader away from from organizing the rebuilding of the wall, but we can kill him. And they tried. They tried five times. But I love his response. I'm too busy to do something, doing something significant to waste my time going to talk to you because you're not for me. This is great or what? To achieve what God wants, we can't become distracted. So then their new approach was deceit. Four times they'd they'd sent a message and he didn't respond. And so in verse 5 it says, the fifth time Sambalat sent his aid to me with the same message. And in his hand, get this, in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, it is reported among the nations that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and that you are about to be made king in Jerusalem. And I sent this reply to him. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. (laughs) You're just making it up in your head. Do you know what an open letter is? It's a letter that's written to someone 
knowing that they're not going to read it, but you want everybody else to read it so that they're judged by what your letter says. It's not sent to influence the person to whom it's addressed, because you know that's not going to work. It's sent to influence everybody else. And that becomes a deceitful act. I can't influence Nehemiah, says Tobiah. So I'll try and persuade with this open letter the people of Israel. But again, Nehemiah says, I- I'm too busy. I don't have time for this. And so now they bring pressure. They, they, they bring greater duress. And in verse 10, uh, Shem- Shemaiah says, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple. Let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. Now understand, uh, Shemaiah is, is an Israelite. He, he's, he's a counselor to Nehemiah, and he's saying, hey, let's get you to a place of safety. Let's sequester you in the temple. And in verse 11, Nehemiah says, should a man like me run away? Should one like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. See, this was a well-intentioned friend, apparently more concerned for Nehemiah than Nehemiah was for himself. But Nehemiah was ready to trust God with his life in order to finish the work that God had raised him up to do. Why? Because leaders are people of focus, and they're people of resolve, and they understand what the goal is, and they stay focused and move toward that. I'm told that one day a farmer's donkey uh, fell down into a well and the animal cried piteously for hours as the farmer tried to figure out how he could get his donkey out of the well. Finally, he decided that the animal was probably getting along in age and and, uh, had probably been hurt from falling down the well and uh, he didn't need to rescue the donkey, so he invited his neighbors around to come and help him uh, shovel dirt in and bury the donkey. And as they began to shovel the dirt in the hole, the donkey's cries became even more urgent as this rainfall of dirt and soil fell over him. And then, to the amazement of everyone, he quieted right down. They thought, well, maybe we've covered him up. Maybe we've got it. So they kept throwing in to make sure he was there. And a few shovel loads later, the farmer looked into the well, and he was astonished at what he saw. (laughs) Because with every shovel of dirt that hit his back, the donkey would shake it off and take a step up. And with every new shovel load, the donkey would shake it off, take a step up, shake it off, take a step up, until the donkey stepped out over the edge of the well and trotted off. (laughs) It's easy to get discouraged by the rainfall of, of criticism and persistent opposition and the the fight against you but don't get diverted shake it off and move on stick with the objective leaders focused on the goal they determine what needs their attention and it's not to get distracted three times opposition and crises surface that could have drawn Nehemiah's attention away from the objective. Uh, Some of those problems were external, critics from outside demanding his response. Uh, Others were internal problems that were inherent in the community. And you know, churches are no different. We have critics from outside, but we have people who are not happy about the way things are going, and there are issues that need to be resolved. No church is perfect. And Leaders need to determine, what do we ignore? What do we deal with? What is the response? How do we best move forward to accomplish kingdom work? That's what God has for us. That's what our objective is as part of the church of Christ. It's to be kingdom-focused, kingdom-directed, and stay the course even when problems arise. And so I encourage you to do that in your own life. 
pray for the leadership of Burnett Fellowship, that they might keep to the goal and the objective and know what needs to be done, what needs to be ignored, and to trust God in the process of moving forward. So what we do, we do for his glory.
Again, in all of our lives, uh, there are uh, problems, there are difficulties, there are things we need to overcome, but be encouraged. God has a purpose, God has a plan for you and your life, a kingdom purpose. You've been brought into his family to make a difference. And I encourage you this week to be before God in prayer, to ask God how you can fulfill his purpose and plan for you. And that you would not get bogged down in criticism, not be part of a, a conflict, but be able to persevere and move forward and honor God by what you do. God wants to use you, wants to use you this day, this week, for his glory. Let's pray. Father, I pray for these, your people. We are in unusual times, but you need people who represent your kingdom, your kingdom work, who you are. Your love and your grace in this world is seen in and through us. May we, our Father, be a people who love and honor you. And may you bless us as we persevere for the greater kingdom work that magnifies a great and glorious God. Amen. Go in peace this week.